Genesis, Registro Genesis, and the East Asian Voicing Shift by Brian Gehrman and Richard Dawson. Okay, thanks. So our goals today are sort of review the state of the art in our models of tonogenesis and registrogenesis for the greater mainland Southeast Asia area. So we'd like to just sort of take stock of where we are in this process and where we go from here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to review the role of onset phonation and codophonation reanalysis in the development of tone and register in East Asia. And we'll discuss the relative chronology and prototypical tonogenesis for the region. Um, we'll sort of review the received model, which uh, casts the codophonation reanalysis as the first wave of tonogenesis. And we'll propose a possible alternative model uh, that casts onset phonation reanalysis as coming first. And then we'll talk about the implications and the outlook of this. But before we get into this, fair warning that this talk will call some widely accepted beliefs into question. Uh, and we recognize this, and we just ask you to keep an open mind while we uh, talk through it. Uh, wait till you get to the end to uh, <laughs> judge it. So we're not sure about all of this either, but we, our goal is to start the conversation. So, okay. First of all, a quick review of tonogenesis in greater mainland Southeast Asia. Um, in this region, we have the um, senospheric tone bund phenomenon, which is basically the concept of convergent tonogenesis, in that tones are innovated in the same way over and over again, analogically. Um, codophonation is reanalyzed as tone. Onset phonation is also reanalyzed as tone, resulting in simplification of phonation contrast in the segments. And this same process is found in the vast majority of tone languages in greater mainland Southeast Asia. And I think most of us will be familiar with the tone box concept at the bottom there. Uh, so we, there's sort of a received chronological interpretation of this process. Um, it's generally accepted that codophonation is transphonologized first into pitch contours, which are interpreted as phonemic tones. So this is phonemic change we're talking about here. And thereafter, we get the reanalysis of the onset phonation contrasts, which with the effect that those uh, pitch contours are split into two absolute pitch levels or registers. And with the phonemic result that we have tone splits and the proliferation of tonal contrasts in the language. Um, so we call this the coda catalyst model, the received model of how this works. Uh, it was proposed early on, it was um, sort of a, uh, based on some observations of Odricors real early on, and then, you know, Matisoff's influential Tono Genesis paper um, took it uh, for granted, and it's basically been taken for granted ever since. It's a given in the historical construction of um, the language families and subfamilies in the region. There's a sampling of them here. Um, but basically, yeah, every major historical work uh, in, in the area takes this, um, this periodization the sequential interpretation of phonemic change as, as a given. Um, and as I say, presented in terms of phonemic sound change. If we want to um, look at this uh, in sort of a, a diagram form here, we've got a conservative stage one followed by a stage two where the coda phonation is reanalyzed as tones labeled as ABC. You see differential pitch contours in the lines to the left. And then in stage three, each of those contours is split by onset phonation, resulting in uh, six tonal contrasts. Okay, so assessing this model, what does this model predict we should see if we look around the region? Uh, we would predict that there would be contemporary examples of languages at two stages then. Uh, the more conservative stage would be what we'll call CP only languages. So ones that have only reanalyzed coda phonation. That's what we mean by CP there. And so the tones in these languages would correspond to historical codophonation contrasts only. And then we should also see more innovative languages, which have the integration of the onset phonation reanalysis, making for more complex tone inventories. And those tones will correspond to both historical coda and onset phonation contrasts. Um, but what we actually see when we look around is a gap in the model's prediction uh, in that, CP-only languages are surprisingly rare throughout Greater Mainland Southeast Asia. 
In my own recent uh, survey of all of Austroasiatic, I found no examples of such a language, which is particularly surprising since Austroasiatic is more conservative in terms of tonal development than the other uh, language families of the region. And then looking in the Sinospheric Tone Bund proper, where we already have tone languages, um, we find only very few examples of languages that have tones that correspond to codification only, historical codification only. Some examples here that we unfortunately don't have time to look at the details of, but um, we will go into more detail on this in our paper, but there are ambiguities about each of these individual um, examples here that actually make it difficult to interpret the, the sequentiality of the, of the historical sound changes. So um, it's not, these are not straightforward examples of CP only languages is the short story there. Um, now on the contrary, OP only languages, which is to say languages that have uh, tones or uh, registers that are um, uh, that correspond to historical onset phonation contrasts are common. Uh, but they're typically overlooked when we're talking about tonogenesis in greater mainland Southeast Asia because they're usually called register languages and considered separately in the registrogenesis phenomenon, which is modeled separately. So on that note, let's take a quick look at register and tone and their, uh, how they overlap in greater mainland Southeast Asia. So the most important thing to remember is that register is not voice quality. Register is more than voice quality. Register is a bundle of interrelated cues, um, including voicing onset time, voice quality, vowel quality, and pitch. And different languages make use of different um, cues from this bundle in different, with different priorities. But um, we're talking about more than just voice quality when we talk about register. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. So the traditional model of registrogenesis is that you have on historical onset voicing, um, those on the voiced ones devoice, and then uh, we get uh, cues from that register bundle arise to uphold the contrast. And ultimately, uh, vowel quality cues uh, will phonemicize and condition vowel splits, increasing the um, number of vowel contrasts in the language, as we see in Khmer. This is often called the Khmer model. Um, I proposed a uh, formalized and expanded model in my uh, thesis, recent thesis, um, but th these are not uh, new ideas. These are based on ideas that were already expressed by uh, Udrakor, Ferlus, and even Huffman himself, in that there are sort of two primary outputs of a register language. They can evolve in the direction of vowel proliferation as Khmer, as the Huffman's uh, traditional model, or they can um, evolve in the direction of tonality in that the, the high register becomes a high tone, the low register becomes a low tone, you're left with a simple two-tone system or a F0 prominent register contrast. That's two ways to say the same thing. There's not really any difference between them. Um, so a register can evolve along an F1 prominent path where F1 cues are um, pr primary or more reliable or along an F0 prominent path where the F0 cues become prominent and the most reliable. And that doesn't mean the other register cues won't be there. It just means that eventually one of those two tends to win out if we look around the more mature register languages uh, in the region. Skip this too in the interest of time. Okay, so that being said, we are suggesting that there may be a problem with our model. So what is the alternative? So indulge in a thought experiment with us. Uh, what if codification did not come first? Now this is the heretical part, so don't uh, keep listening. Um, so we noted that CP only languages, that is languages with tones that correspond to uh, historical codification contrast only are barely attested. Whereas OP only languages are widely attested though often not considered to be tone languages. We would argue that they are potential future tone languages. Um, yeah, so we're including the, especially the F0 primary register languages, which are rapidly becoming tone languages. Um, so we think if we were going to build the, our model of tonogenesis from scratch today in light of these uh, distributional uh, observations here, then we might be tempted to hypothesize that it, maybe it's actually onset phonation reanalysis that comes first, not codification. So a few lines of evidence for this is as we've, uh, um, the fact that CP only is the starting point of our received model. Um, 
but actually that appears to be an outlier in terms of uh, typology. So should we not be modeling that as the outlier rather than the root of the model? Um, and uh, sort of related to that is um, our received model has OP only as an outlier. Like I said, it's modeled separately outside of tonogenesis in this registrogenesis phenomenon. But is there a case to be made that OP only might actually be the starting point? We think perhaps. Um, another line of evidence. If we look at conservative uh, emergent tone languages um, in the sinospheric tone blend typology, um, they are marked by total redundancy in segmental and supersegmental cues, by which we mean uh, the codophonation differences are still there, the onset phonation differences are still there, and yet the emerging tonal properties of voice quality or pitch across the whole rhyme are also there. So we have the redundancy of all of these cues in these. Uh, in these historical um, categories. So two good examples of that are Rook and Lise, two languages of Vietnam, both Austro-Asiatic. Austro um, so in this context, how do we know which one came first when we look at uh, this total redundancy, right? OP or CP? Uh, well, the fact is both of these languages have close relatives that are OP only, and they have no CP only relatives at all. So that is at least suggestive that those OP only relatives may be reflecting an earlier stage of their own development and might be suggesting that OP came first in Rook and Lise, all things being equal. And a third line of evidence is that Cenospheric Tonebun typology dominates the north of Greater Mainland Southeast Asia, and then it fades out as you go farther south uh, with these examples of emergent tone languages like those uh, Rook and Lise in between. And further south is where we find many examples of OP only languages. Austroasiatic, of course, being what's mostly associated with the register phenomenon. But there's also Austronesian languages of both the mainland and island areas that have done similar things to onset phonation contrasts. So is the south merely more conservative? And is the interaction with the coda phonation um, a trend moving from north to south? Possibly. OK, but let's back up a second. And let's ask, how does onset phonation reanalysis really work? So uh, Ricker and I have proposed the concept of the East Asian voicing shift, um, describing it as the massively cross-linguistic transphonologization of onset voicing contrasts as tones or registers in East and Southeast Asia over the past millennium. And um, we find this a useful concept in that it's fundamental to both tonogenesis and registrogenesis as they are currently modeled. So what, how does this begin? It begins as a phonetic shift, and we'll stress that it's phonetic change at the beginning. Phonetic shift in the cues associated with the historical onset voice in contrast. Historically, VOT contrasts, difference of phasing of, of voicing onset time. And then that expands to um, various co-articulations out of the register bundle of cues that we talked about before. VOT, pitch, voice quality, vowel quality, perhaps some others. And then ultimately it resolves into phonemic change over time, but it takes time to move from the phonetic to the phonemic. And those phonemic changes take the form of either innovative vowel contrast or innovative tone contrast as we uh, outlined earlier. So on this definition, an OP only language is a language without pre-existing tones, which is e either undergoing the EAV EAVS currently it's undergoing that phonetic shift from VOT to register cues, or has undergone the AVS with phonemic output, uh, phonemic uh, implications already. And there are various ways to analyze such a language. We'll skip that for now. All right. So what we're driving at here is a plausible alternative model rooted in um, on changes to onset phonation being the catalyst rather than changes to coda phonation. So we're calling this the onset catalyst hypothesis. And the way we model it, the East Asian voicing shift comes first with those phonetic changes that I just outlined, VOT cues evolving into various co-articulations out of the register bundle. Um, thereafter, you'll get a gradual drift towards either pitch or vowel quality prominence. We talked earlier about how you can have an F1 primary tone language, or sorry, register language that evolves towards vowel splits or an F0 primary register language, which evolves towards uh, uh, tonal proliferation. 
So at this point, the model branches in two directions based on which one of those um, cues out of the register bundle becomes prominent. So you, there's a tonogenetic route and a register genetic route. Now, we want to really stress that at this point, none of this needs to be phonemic. Okay, this can, this can all just be phonetic changes into the cues upholding the historical um, OP contrast, the onset phonation contrast. And, you know, it's why they recognize that register is frequently ambiguous between whether it's segmental or super segmental because of this Q redundancy, right? We don't exactly have phonemic change yet. All right, now sticking on the tonogenetic track, um, codophonation interactions begin to affect um, the realization of, um, of the register. So the F0 prominent register will interact with codophonation um, and this is natural because we've got uh, laryngeal gestures from the left and the right producing differences of phonation uh, or over differences of pitch. And um, over time, what happens is we get more complex integrated cue patterns, which uh, facilitate the different laryngeal gestures on the left and right edge of the word. So these patterns develop across the syllable and with the effect that different combinations of register and codophonation develop differently. Um, now, again, we'll stress, this is still not necessarily phonemic change. The languages Rook and Lee say that we mentioned earlier still have full redundancy of this kind, these kind of uh, cues and the historical onset phonation cues. They're all there together at the same time. Okay, and then finally, after that stage where it's all very redundant, uh, then we'll get the phonemicization of tonality when the old segmental cues finally fade and are unrecoverable. Uh, by just by looking at the language in the absence of comparative work. So if we were to um, outline how this works uh, using a similar um, uh, visualization here, uh, stage two, we get the um, EAVS has uh, with an F0 prominent realization, which causes differences of pitch register. Stage three is where we get the subphonemic interactions with codophonation, which are pooling those uh, two pitch registers in different directions towards the right edge of the word. And in stage four, the codophonation differences fade. And what we are left with is the pitch uh, differences. And we're not modeling voice quality here, but that can be redu another redundant cue to any tone, um, tonal contrast. So what we're left with at stage four is the phonemicized tones. Okay, so you may be asking, all right, but how is this actually an improvement? Well, we think it's an improvement in various ways, potentially, um, in that it, one thing, it removes um, codophonation transphonologization as the catalyst for the whole process. Because remember, that's the first step in the received model. Uh, but that makes, the, that's a little bit uh, awkward because then we have this missing link at the root of the model because it's not found very often, if at all. Um, in, in languages of the region. It's, it's at least rarely attested. And so um, that's of course suspicious. Um, and, but then again, spontaneous onset phonation transphonologization is better attested, especially here, but also in other places around the world. Um, so therefore we have a precedented natural sound change sitting at the root of the model rather than a, a one that's suspiciously absent. Um, it also explains the transphonologization of codophonation uh, phonetically in that it's modeled as uh, emerging out of interactions between F0 and voice quality patterns from the East Asian voicing shift. And finally, it unifies prototypical tonogenesis and registrogenesis under one model, if this is all really the way that it typically goes, because both the two outcomes, the tonogenetic path and the registrogenetic path, are uh, each path emerges out of the East Asian voicing shift based on the relative prominence of either F1 cues or F0 cues. So that's rather neat if it, if it all uh, works out. Now, many of you are already thinking, wait, what about the written evidence? And yes, that is something that we have to talk about. Um, the written record seems to show CP only. Um, for example, in the Brahmi scripts and in the in the Thai among the Thai languages, they use orthographic tone marks, quote unquote tone marks, which are um, which correspond to historical differences of codophonation, which are taken to be the first ever known use of phonemic tone marking in orthography. 
furthermore, in uh, the Chiyun and other um, um, rhyming dictionaries of early Middle Chinese, they have the concept of the tone groups with names like level, uh, entering, departing. Uh, so these are taken to represent phonemic tones based on F-zero contours. Um, but we wonder if we might need to reconsider our interpretations of what these uh, orthographic conventions really mean. Uh, the Chiu Yun and the Brahmi scripts like, like Dai were certainly representing phonemic contrasts. There's no doubt that these are categorical phonemic contrasts that they're um, talking about there. But we wonder if we have oversimplified the phonetics of these contrasts with an overemphasis on the idea that tone equals pitch and voicing equals voicing onset time, when actually, uh, what we see when we look around modern languages is that tone often is not just pitch and voicing is often something more akin to register, right? And um, we think we need to do more to overtly incorporate the idea of co-articulations and gradual phonetic change over time, um, not only into our tonogenetic model, but also into our interpretation of historical written records, which are talking about similar languages. Um, so, you know, we, we cast, we uh, interpret tonogenesis as being compensatory for the loss of segmental contrast. Um, and that's true over time, but let's not forget that there are phonetic traces of code of phonation, uh, like gaudalization and, and voicelessness, uh, still attested in modern tone languages. Like for example, in Sinitic, uh, we have examples of both of those among uh, modern tone languages, which means that those, um, that there must've been redundancy between Coda um, glottalization and coda voicelessness, along with the, the pitch um, differences in these tonal categories of early Middle Chinese. Uh, it would have presumably looked something more like modern rook, which we mentioned before, with the full redundancy. Um, yeah, and like, I'm going to skip that because we're about out of time. But I uh, just want to stress that these are not revolutionary ideas. You know, Pulley Blank was already talking about this kind of thing in the 70s. And I'm not going to read the quote to you in the interest of time. But, um, you know, he, are, he was already talking about early Middle Chinese as having an incipient or quasi tonal system rather than fully developed tones. So, um, just to quickly do some conclusions here. Uh, the development of tone and register is complex and our understanding of it has been evolving, you know, all along in the past century. And we've learned a lot, you know, even in the past decade, as we're trying to get more nuance into our interpretation of the phonetics and phonology of uh, tone and register and how things change over time. But we still have a long way to go. And we believe that it's clear that the East Asian voicing shift is a primary driver of both tonogenesis and registrogenesis. We believe it's clear that there's a gap where the CP only languages should be. There should be more of them. And we think it's clear that OP only languages are well attested, even though they're, they're modeled as outliers in current total tonogenetic theory. We also think it's clear that the received sequentiality of codophonation change, onsophonation change developing into tone uh, fails to reflect the apparent simultaneity of gradual phonetic change in these contrastive categories. Now, we also believe it's possible that we're overstating codophonation transphonologization's role as um, instigating the tonogenetic process um, in the received model. And we also believe it's possible that it's actually the East Asian voicing shift and phonetic change in the onset voicing contrasts that actually encourages um, the eventual uh, evolution of, of tone. And um, it's possible that, that if that's true, that the unifies tonogenesis and registrogenesis as both being catalyzed by this change in um, onset voicing in the East Asian voicing shift. And this is all the strong version of the argument. Um, so where we go from here, we wanna keep surveying tonogenesis in the region, especially we need more information on tibeto burman groups. Uh, we want to encourage uh, phonetically detailed field work on semispheric tone bun languages. Um, and uh, we want to examine converging lines of evidence to help us figure out when and where tonogenesis and registrogenesis have taken place. And finally, we want to further interrogate the Indic influence on uh, how the laryngeal phonetics of the uh, early written record, uh, how they were um, conceptualizing what these contrastive uh, categories uh, meant. You know, what did they mean by voice stops, you know, for example? So that's a whole other paper. 
but those are some future lines of inquiry. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.